not. Uh, and so he said to himself, maybe I would, uh, what I will do is I'll go and sit down and just paraphrase it. So he paraphrased a lot of the Bible, uh, pretty much all of the Bible. And that's, uh, it is offered, it's, it's available for you to read. It's called the message. And if you get a chance, you can read it. And I wanted to use the translation that uh, Sunil read was from the NRSV. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a beautiful translation. NRSV is probably the one that is closer to Greek. When I was in seminary, um, I, I, I grew up with the NIV, the New International Version. Uh, so when I went to seminary at Princeton, I had the NIV and I, and I read NIV for the first time and the whole class turned to look at me and said, what's wrong with you? Uh, because uh, uh, we had, uh, the seminarians had moved from NI NIV to NRSV because NR NRSV is a little bit more closer to the Greek text. So, uh, but I wanted to offer to you what uh, uh, Eugene Peterson writes and I, and I wanted to see if, the, if it'll come up on the screen. Uh, the guys on the media is not uh, hearing because they don't have a microphone. I put that, uh, um, the text for me, Vishal, the, the text that I gave to you from Romans chapter 12. Can you put the text for me? Go back. You don't have the text with you. Okay, that's fine. Don't worry. <clears throat> Here we go. This is what he writes. He paraphrased it. Remember I said he paraphrased it. And this is what he says. So here's what I want you to do. While Paul says, you know, uh, therefore, by the tender mercies of God. But this is how Eugene Peterson, he writes, but here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, and your walking around in life, and place it before God as an offering. Embrace what God does for you is the best you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. A lot of people have a, a love-hate relationship with the, with the epistle of Romans. The epistle of Romans is probably the longest one that Paul writes. He writes to the church uh, in Rome. Probably it was not a church by the time Paul writes. It was probably a small church. It was a home church that he writes. And uh, so he, um, if, you, if you read, if you get a chance to read Romans, uh, Romans is pretty hard to read because he is uh, arguing for some deeper theological truth. And sometimes that's why probably people who start reading Romans halfway through, they just give up uh, hope and they move on to something else because it's pretty dense. But there are two major themes that come up in, in Romans, and I'll tell you why I am doing this. There are two major themes that come up in Romans. Number one, at the very beginning of chapter one itself, he argues, until chapter 11, he will talk about this. The first thing that Paul talks about is sin. Paul talks about it as sin. And he says that at the very beginning in chapter one, that how sin had entered into the, the human life and had marred the things. And it's, it's very hard to get over it, he basically says. It's very hard to get over it. And he says, he'll, he'll, he'll keep talking about sin over and over again. That's why he says, you know, it's an amazing book. Because uh, people like uh, Martin Luther, the greatest reformer of the early church, when, he's, when he opposed the, the Roman church, he, it was his reading of Romans, the epistle of Romans that made him now go and nail that 95 thesis on that door in Wittenberg. It was just the reading of Romans. So what, that's why he says when, when even Martin Luther was reading this text, he saw what Paul was writing. 
what paul says is so important this is what i want you to remember what he writes in romans he says the things that i want to do i don't do but the things that i don't want to do i do think about it isn't it think about it it says the things that i want to do i want to be good i really want to be good i don't want to be mean to you if you hurt me i don't want to be mean to you if you you know let's say a sly word on me i don't want to do this for you but yet he says i do it but then he says the things that i want to do i don't do i want to be good i want to be nice to you but i don't do it and so he says it over and over again he says because the sin that is within us it's terrible it just ruins our lives think about it is that it really does ruin our life and it takes an enormous amount and so paul struggles with it and so when you read romans you begin to understand that you and i are fallen human beings right after the creation from chapter 3 of genesis we are fallen human beings we are mean to each other sometimes we don't like each other we just do all of this it's because paul says that is the deeper sin that is within us it's the original sin that is within us that stops you and me from doing the best in our lives but then paul says at the very end of all of his struggle he says very beautifully he says thanks be to god in jesus christ we have the victory make sense he makes an amazing change he says because he begins to realize that in, it's only in christ that you and i have the victory so the first theme that romans talks about is sin but the second thing this talks about is grace which is completely different from sin is that right so he says hey, god i struggle with it and i do all of this but then i realize that i am not saved by what i have done or what i do but i am saved by this thing called grace is that right and he tries to explain to the people who are struggling with this idea about what grace is all about is that right grace is this you you don't deserve it it's this unmerited you cannot work for it you really cannot work for it if you think that you can work for grace then you've lost it that is grace if you get a chance read the book by philip yancey it's a book it's a small it's a, it's a wonderful book which is called what's so amazing about grace because there is something about uh, amazing about grace and he tells at the very beginning of the of his book it's called the babbitt's feast it was made into a movie somewhere in the 1950s now the story is very simple it's 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 located in a small danish island in small island where there is a priest with two daughters and what all the priest does is he want to live a righteous life and so he teaches his uh, is his small village people of how to be righteous before god and so he people in that small village only wear black and white because they think if they wear something colorful that they are against god and so they only wear black and white and they have a very simple supper they come to sabbath on sunday morning and they don't do anything and this man try is trying all his best to lead his congregation through this what is called his own righteousness of his understanding of the scripture so babbitt's feast is it's so that, that's where the story of the and he has two daughters uh, one is called martine and the other is called philippe and both of them are beautiful to look at and you know what uh, he writes he says sometimes these both women will hide behind their their ordinary clothes because they say to themselves if i reveal my beauty guess what i am sinning and so they they hide behind during their lifetime what happens is there are two men who come to see them and they like them they want to get married but uh, both of them refuse the offer and in the process and both of them decide to stay in the village stay in that small island and not go anywhere and as the uh, time passes and the father dies and the two sisters begin to run the church they do it faithfully like the father does keeping all of the commandments still teaching their the children and the grandchildren about how to keep their commandments and one night it's a pouring rain on that night and she they hear a sound in their 
door and they open the door and this woman who is all drenched in rain stands and all she's asking is can i come into this house just give me shelter and she has a note and that note says very there's only one thing it says please accept babbit into your house and then the next line it says she cooks well she is a great cook any indian home will invite them isn't it so the the, the two sisters invite this woman to come and stay in their house what all she does is she will cook for all the shelter that she gets and as she is living in the time passes about 10 to 15 year passes she gets a note she is from france and she gets a note from her dear friend fr from france and it says babbit remember that you had a lottery ticket and that lottery ticket this year your number got picked and it's almost like $10,000 on you and babbit gets excited and as she shares this news with these two sisters who are staying with them and she says i have won this lottery and the two sisters are now thinking babbit is going to leave them is that right so babbit says but before i leave can i throw a feast for the village and so they say okay and so you know what babbit does she buys the most expensive wine the wine that the, the small island has never seen wine that they have never tasted a wine from france to have wine from france is one of the best wines you can have is that right so she orders the best wine she gets the best food and she spends a week cooking and then on that day of uh, the feast it's a snowy day she invites all of the fam all of the people in that village to come to this town to come to this place for dinner and she sets it up so beautifully and they are all wondering what is the catch why is babbit doing this now she says i just want to throw a dinner for you guys and they all sit down there remember i told you the father was the priest and he was leading and after the father had died the the congregation began to be started to bicker with each other they began to hurt each other they were not nice to each other there was more animosity than friendship but yet they came every sunday morning and they did their thing and went away but they were not nice to each other and so it that babbit's feast they all sit down together and as they are eating one says to the other i'm sorry for what i have done i was not nice to you and the feast begins to turn into a whole new thing forgiveness is shared with each other and after the feast is over everybody is you know once again the whole village has come together at that feast and after the feast is over and everybody is leaving and the dishes are piled and babbit is sitting down there and the sisters look at babbit and they are very excited about uh, the feast that they had but then they are also very sad isn't it because babbit is going to leave and so they look at babbit and they said uh, um, i think you are going to leave us isn't it and babbit says uh, no i am not going back to france and then the both the sisters look at them and says then what about the money the 10000 dollars he said i spent it all on the dinner that i gave you and then she says uh, because to have a good meal a very good meal in france will cost that much and so she says i have spent all the money on the dinner and the story writer at the very end it says you know what it says very simply it costs the giver everything but it doesn't cost the one who receives anything am i making sense it cost the giver everything but for the one who receives it it costs nothing do you want to know understand what grace is that's what grace is why did i tell all of this when my topic is about do not be conformed 
Because for 11 chapters of Romans, Paul has argued what sin can do in your life. And at the end of chapter, at the beginning of chapter 12, he takes a big pause, a deep breath. And then you know what he says? Do not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your minds. You might ask, Pastor, what does this conf confirming look like? Or why is, is Paul contradicting something? Because earlier in chapter 11 or chapter 10 and, and all of those places, he will say, I have become everything so that I can save a few. You remember that verse? I have become this one for this person. I have become this one for this person so that I might be able to redeem them for Jesus Christ. And you come here and you read it and he says, do not be confirmed. Paul, isn't that what you said earlier? Are you contradicting yourself? Paul would say, no, I am not. So again, you ask your question, so what does conformity look like? Have you, have you guys done gingerbread cookies? You do, the, you do all of those, those dough and you keep it, right? And you have those cookie cutters and you take it and you press it and you see it comes out, isn't it? That's what Paul says. When Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, he simply says, do not have a cookie cutter approach to the Christian life. Oh, oftentimes our children will say this to you. And sometimes you and I will even say this to you. Why did we do this? Because she did it. Isn't it? Because he did it. That's what Paul says. Conformity is, this is what the world is asking me to do, and so I did it. Now Paul says, no, don't go there. Don't be that way. But instead, let your minds be transformed. And you know the, what the word that he uses is the word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is when that little, you know, small thing, what we call it as a, a pupa, that turns into a butterfly. Paul says, you and I cannot be conforming to this world, but you and I are to, to be transformed. You and I will, can never be con conformed to the ways of the world. Am I making sense? You know, what God requires of you and me is not to be conformed to the ways of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. I'll finish with these three things quickly. You might ask me, why is Paul telling all of that? Why is Paul asking us not to conform to the ways of this world? Here are my three things and I will do it. Number one, simply this is what he says. The reason why you and I are not called to conform to this world is because you and I are created different. You and I are wired different. From creation, God's desire is that you and I are made in God's image. You know, when God created us and he said, I have made you in my image. And after when we fell down, the image is not completely taken away from us. The image of God still lives you, you and me. That's the reason, sometimes remember, we are able to forgive the unforgivable. We are able to love the unlovable. You know why? Because that image of God is so deeply imprinted in your life and in my life. The reason why we cannot, we cannot conform to this world but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds is because, folks, you and I are wired differently. Are you with me? You and I are wired differently. Number two, this is what it is. I told you earlier, what grace is all about. Simply, it costed the giver everything, isn't it? And it did not cost you and me anything. The reason why we need to not conform to this world, but we live our lives in a transformed way is because it costed God a lot. Are you with me? Because Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a guy who, a German scholar who came to the U.S. to study, and he was studying at New York, and that's the time Hitler was in his prime. 
And so he stayed here and he said, uh, when my people in Germany are suffering, how can I live a very comfortable life? And he goes back and he, he literally wants to overthrow Hitler and he is killed. Before, the, before he could uh, be tried, he was killed. And you know what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, and it's very true. You know what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says? Bonhoeffer says very simply, grace is free, but it's not cheap. Folks, grace is free. You don't have to do anything. But it's not cheap. It costed God his very own. The reason why Paul says to you and me that we cannot conform to the ways of the world is because it costed God a lot. This is my last one. The reason why we cannot conform to this ways of the world is simply this. It's not a requirement. It's not a requirement. It's a response to what God has done for us in Jesus. Oftentimes we think the reason why God calls us not to conform to this world is because somehow if we do the right thing that we will be accepted by God. We know, I say this to, to myself and I want to say this to you over and over again. And I'm being very serious. This is, there's one thing that you want to get out of my sermon. This is the only thing. You and I know that we have been redeemed by grace, but we live as if we are living by works. We constantly are doing something. We tell ourselves, I need to do something to be accepted by God. Isn't it? You tell yourself, I need to be here on church on Sunday morning because that's the way God wants me to be. Because if I do it, guess what? I get a checklist on God's, you know, the list, the list that he has. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. I tell myself, you know, when I was growing up, uh, mom will never give us a cup of coffee if we don't read the Bible. And so what I do is I will turn on the Bible. I will read quickly and I'll say, mom, I need a coffee. I finished mine. Because I tell myself the reason why I need to do this, I need to check mark these things. I need to say, I woke up this morning, God, I spent five minutes in you, check it, check it off. I woke up this morning, I read my text, yes, check it off. God, I came to Sunday morning, I gave my one tenth because we want to live by works. But you and I know for sure that we have been redeemed by grace. Isn't it? Why does Paul come to chapter 12 to say this is because he wants to remind you and me, guess what? The need for us to not to confirm is because it's only a response to what God has already done. It's not a requirement. It is not a requirement. It is a response, folks. Don't be conformed when God says it's just a response to what God has already done. There is nothing you can do to gain God's favor. There is nothing you can do to gain God's favor. God has already done it in Jesus. You just need to accept it. I am, in many ways, a conformist. Because I want to fit into it, isn't it? But there are occasions where I have stood up and said, no, that's not how it works. And the times when I stood up, it's not because I was strong enough. It's what Paul says, isn't it? By the tender mercies of God. You and I, you know, the ways of the world are so attractive that it's easy to conform than to be transformed. It's easy to go with the flow. And it's hard to stand against the currents, isn't it? But the only reason why God calls us to live that way is because it costed him a lot. And your, the way is not to conform is because it's only a response. It's only a response to what God has done. Never a requirement. Will you pray with me? Will you say to God?
can say to God, God, deep within me, and I know I have been redeemed by grace. But yet I live every day, oh God, as if it, this is what I need to do. God, you're, you're asking me this morning not to conform to the ways of this world, but to live transformed lives. And I think sometimes I can do this on my own. I don't know where you are. Because oftentimes I live my life. I have a checklist that I do every morning thinking that I need to do this to gain God's favor. That I need to conform to the ways. That I need to do this because I'll be accepted by God. That's not how it works, oh God. I just want to live a life that is pleasing to you. I really want to live a life that is pleasing to you, oh God. We as a church want to live a life that is pleasing to you. I don't know if the words that I preached made sense to you. I don't know. But if it made sense, then say to God, God, you know, I, I know you want me to live a non-conformed life. Not because I will get accepted, but that's your heart's desire. If you say that to God, not me, don't say that for me. Say it to God for yourself. Tell God, God, give me the strength. Give me the strength, oh God. Because it's only by your tender mercies that I can live that way. Not on my own. Not on my strength, Lord, but on your strength. You would not have said something that we cannot do. You would not have said anything, O oh God, that we cannot do. So, God, I pray a blessing on all of us who have heard this word, O oh God, be it here or be it online. I pray that you would make a difference in their lives this week. We thank you, we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray.